Okay, lots to go over tonight. This is a short week and now it's really gonna catch up. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is how meters work. And on the surface, you kind of think, well, do I really care about how like a Simpson meter works or some old analog meter works? Because, you know, after all, you get out of here and you're probably not going to use an analog meter. You're going to go right for a digital one because they're more accurate and easier to use. But where it actually comes into play is that aircraft use analog instruments still. And understanding how analog instruments work goes a long way to troubleshooting stuff. Uh, it's just not enough to be an aircraft mechanic and for uh, a pilot owner to come in and say, well, this meter is reading, you know, well, my gauge says this. You don't know why that gauge says that. Where is it getting its input? What does that input mean? And, and uh, how does it work? So, and this is just another great example of how to work with Ohm's Law. So that's what we're going to cover tonight. Hopefully. All right, so let's see. Well, I guess I'll just stick with my notes. I always say that. So understanding. Understanding how electric measuring. Electric measuring instruments. Instruments work. Work will help you will help you understand understand how aircraft aircraft instruments work instruments work it's kind of hard to troubleshoot something if you don't know why you're getting a reading that you're getting guys that just came from our summer class 313 Eric be one of them since you're in that line right so oh I won't put you on the spot but we talk about a pilot talking about I have high fuel flow what are they really saying to a mechanic you have high pressure doesn't mean high fuel flow it means you have high pressure we have to understand that so a lot so the same way. Sorry, right, we're gonna talk about volt voltmeters, volt voltmeters. Well, they indicate what? Uh, indicate voltage. Voltage. Um, sometimes my, like I said, my outline here is messed up, but I just have to stick with it. So there are different type of movements. That's an O M O V E M E N T S movements. And that's what makes the meter actually move. And one of the earliest types of movements that they used for reading electrical volts, that is, was the galvanometer. G A L V O let's see, V A V A N O. M E T E R. Yes. In a galvanometer, galvanometer is a device. It is a device that reacts, that reacts to minute elect device, D-E-V-I-C-E, -E, that reacts to minute electromagnetic electromagnetic influences caused, caused within itself within itself by the flow of a small amount of current by the flow of a small amount of current so it's kind of an interesting statement that I said well we're looking at voltmeters and the first thing we talk about is voltmeters is a galvanometer that works by 
the flow of current, which is amps. amps. So we're going to measure voltage through the, by the flow of amps. And that's the way all of these are going to work. And I'm going to sh kind of show you why that works. So we have this meter here, the G meter. And what is it really? I'll tell you what it is. I have a little picture. It's a very simple, like I told you, this is one of the first devices. So it's a very simple, a very simple. Galvanometer is just a magnetized needle, just a magnetized needle suspended in a coil of wire. In a coil in a coil of wire. Like that. So there you go. You have a little needle sitting right there, and you have this. So it's a magnetized needle, and it's going to want to point towards north. All right, and then you have a coil of wire. And when you pass current through this wire, it is going to change. It's going to create a magnetic field, which will then influence the needle. So it's kind of like a compass? Kind of like a compass. Well, it would be a compass, actually. So a compass with a coil of wire, electromagnetic, that goes around it, that influences it. So when current flows through the coil of wire, a magnetic field is produced, and the needle aligns itself with the field. Just a very crude way of saying there's current flowing. Is that what it really looks like? Yeah. That would be a very crude one. Well, you're not going to see that mounted to your instrument panel, but... <laughs> Uh, let's see here. When, yeah, that's not really what the inside of your Simpson looks like. <laughs> when current f uh, flows through the coil, I gotta go up through the coil. Uh, current flows through the coil of wire. A magnetic field is produced, <clears throat> and the needle aligns itself with the field. So that's a very simple, crude one that they first come up with, and it works. And it's worth noting, if you haven't already figured out, because we're going to talk a lot about this, and we're going to see a lot of things that have that. Whenever you have wire that is wrapped in a coil, and you pass current through it, you create an electromagnet, or a magnet that is created with electricity. So we're going to see that electromagnetic in a, uh, coil in a lot of things, starting with your motor project has that, correct? Mm -hmm. And how many places? Two. two. Keep going. Motor e. So you have, where, where are the two? Uh, relay. Relay. Motor. Motor. Yeah. Relay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so your motor has it in there too. Several of them. So your relays do and the motors do. So, all right. So that, that's the old, old type there. This is a, a more common type. Try and make sure I spell it correctly here with the proper D arson ball. D A R S O N V A L. Or sometimes called, because I must have fought over who created it, or Weston meter. All right, this is the most common type. of meter <clears throat> it employs 
well it used to employ but they have a better deal stayed at home on the Biden plan but it used mm -hmm. to employ a moving a moving coil and permanent magnet so I'll show you a picture and then we'll come back to this Looks just like the other one, doesn't it? There we go. All right, so indicating needle, the indicating needle right there is, okay, use this over here. Get the pointer. Your indicating needle is attached to a movable coil. So there we see the coil right there with, with uh, coils of wire on there and you have your, your permanent magnet. And so as current flows through that, it is going to get stronger and stronger and remember that in magnets, they, the likes repel. So as this north, it creates more of a north magnet, you can see the north right here, it's gonna repel it more and more and more off to one side. So now when you look at that, you kind of think about, oh, that poor little Simpson meter you guys have, when you hook it up backwards, then it makes this the south up here and this the north, and that's why this needle is down here, it just kind of shakes a little bit, because it's the north and south are attracted to each other. So, ah, so you turn it around, and then you blast it because you have, you know, 400 milliamps on the 10 amp scale and it slams over to this side. It's shaking over here. I worked with the guy who says shaking like a dog passing a peach pit. And <laughs> you're welcome for that visual. And so, <laughs> so, all right. So because, because you got the north, it, you got the electromagnet is so strong because there's so much current going over it that you're just slamming it across the other side of the scale. So now you can kind of see that it's actually this little de delicate, delicate balancing act where you have a little spring right here and it has to overcome the spring and deflect. So it's not good for it to, uh, to abuse it like that. But all right, that's what that looks like. So go back to here, moving coil and a permanent magnet <clears throat> the indicating needle indicating needle is attached indicating needle is attached attached to a movable coil to a movable coil and as current flows through the coil, through the coil, up and in, and north, <clears throat> and is repelled, Oops. is repelled by north of the magnet. And attracted to south of the magnet. The more the current flow, the more the current flow, the stronger the coil. stronger the coil, the more needle deflection. The deflection. <clears throat> uh, let's see. The amount of current, remember, what are we measuring? Voltage, we keep talking about current, kind of weird, huh? Because you gotta have electron flow through a coil in order to get the magnetic effect. So the amount of current, the amount, the amount of current required, amount of current required to turn the needle, 
required to turn the needle will depend on the magnet strength and number of turns a while wire will it will depend on the magnet strength magnet strength and number of turns a scroll number of turns of wire in the coil because this, this strength of an electromagnet is dependent upon the number of turns that you have in the coil one or two turns isn't going to do much but you put a whole bunch of turns on something and you can actually make some work happen with very very little bit of current flow um, there we go only suitable for measuring DC, which stands for what? Direct current. Direct current. <clears throat> I actually have DC current. Can't really say DC current, can you? No. That's like going to the ATM machine. <clears throat> but I go to the automatic ATM machine. <laughs> Why? Why you suppose it's only good for DC? It does. So direct current is in a straight line. It is from <laughs> negative to positive. Doesn't change. It's always flowing in one direction through the wire. But AC, alternating current, as the name implies, it changes. So for a very brief period of time, it's going to go from negative to positive, then it's going to turn around and go back the other way. Then it's going to go that way, then it's going to go that way. It's going to keep going back and forth, back and forth. And so think about that. If you did that in this, the magnet would constantly be changing polarity. And so it would just sit there and shake like a dog. You know, so, it just, so it wouldn't actually measure anything. So only suitable for DC, um, AC. So AC, alternating current. Um, would continuously reverse and vibrate. Would continuously reverse and vibrate. And All right, so that kind of leaves out AC. So what are we gonna do about AC? Well, we can go with another type. Um, I don't have the name for it, but I think it's just a function of the D-Arson ball. But this one will work with either one, DC or AC meter movements. Oh yeah, I do have a name, I forgot. I'll give it to you here. And we'll talk about this one. In, in AC, the voltage and current reverse. Now kind of get used to thinking about that, how it's constantly reversing, it's going back and forth. And if you think about like a light bulb, like your DC light bulb, they work. doesn't matter which way you put the battery on, right? And so if you could, and you were really fast, like the flash or something, because that's what my kids watch, and you took your battery and you took your leads and you went really fast back and forth, the light would just kind of, it wouldn't be real bright, but it'd be dim and it kind of work, right? So it still works. It doesn't matter that it's going back and forth. It works. And so with AC, it's just, it's doing that right now. We just can't see that. Um, one of the tools that we use in aircraft a lot um, in fact, I was just using ours, is a handheld tachometer. Because in our aircraft, um, unless you have, do you have an electric one in yours? Electric tachometer? 
It was part of that JPI. I thought so, yeah. So, like, um, Harry's got an upgraded instrument in his, but I have the, the original, which my tachometer is simply a cable that is in the back of my engine, and it spins this little cable, and it goes through a housing, through my firewall, back up into the instrument panel, and it's spinning back there, and it spins a, a tachometer, and based upon magnets and stuff in there, it will show me my RPM. And you think about that, it's like, wow, how do they get that accurate? Well, they don't. And so over time, these things get really inaccurate. And like my plane, you, right, when you take off, you actually run it right up to red line. And that's where it's supposed to be. And you have to set the governor and hold it to red line. Well, I bought my plane. I, you know, first thing I noticed is, man, this thing's shooting over red line. So the first question is, is it really over red line or is my tachometer lying to me? Well, I use a handheld tack chucker. And, and so the way you check a handheld tack checker to see if it's accurate is you hold it up to fluorescent lights it can see the flashing and so you hold it up to because we're at 60 cycles per second so this is actually reversing 60 times every second so you hold this up to there and it'll tell you and it'll it'll actually give you a reading of rpm You're like there you go it's it's calibrated so then you take it out to your airplane and you run the airplane and it sees the flashes as the propeller blades go by turns out my tachometer was way off uh, it's reading much higher than it should be so but anyway, so it's, it's going back and forth. An interesting thing that really kind of blew my mind, and we're going to talk a lot about it, is it's one thing to say that the current is going back and forth because that is the actual flow of electrons, right? We can kind of picture that and go, okay, I can kind of see that. The electron goes this way, then it's forced to go back the other way. But that's current. Now, so not only does the current go back and forth, but so does the voltage go back and forth. So the voltage builds up and drops off, builds up, drops off. The current builds up, drops off. They don't have to do it together. So if you actually looked at it on a timeline, you could see different colors. You could see current starting out, this would be my zero, and building up and coming back down, and it reverses. This is zero right here, zero volt. Uh, flow of electrons and it'll come back up and go back down and it's just going to keep doing that and then we can look at voltage and say well what is voltage doing well in a perfect world voltage which is much higher than the actual amperage flow is going to do the same thing well that's a perfect world but it's not a perfect world and they can actually get out of sync where you could have your voltage be completely off or it's coming up and it peaks out when your amps are at zero and then it starts coming back down the other way and then it's back at zero when this is at a peak here and it just does and that's a very inefficient circuit um, so we're going to talk about getting rid of inefficiencies and stuff but just so you know that the two don't always have to be in phase so back to this i know man i want your hand is dying is that on the test no it's not on the test <laughs> yet <laughs> this week all right uh so in ac the voltage and current reverse um, they don't have to do it together, but they do. Um, if a DC, okay, I kind of already said this, but um, was it if, if a DC meter, a DC meter is used, comma, the needle will vibrate. Needle will vibrate. Uh, and or be inaccurate. But that's okay because sometimes we're inaccurate, so maybe our inaccuracy coupled with that inaccuracy would get an accurate answer. Who knows? All right. Two wrongs don't make a right? That's it. Two wrongs most definitely make a right. I mean, if you multiply, you know. The three lefts make a right. <laughs> All right, uh, two types, two types of analog movements. What does analog mean? Not digital. Not digital, okay. <laughs> I like that. I'm not old, I'm just analog. You should get that on a shirt. Nope. Add it to the mugs. Add it to the mugs. Uh, usable on 
two types of analog movements. Uh, one, usable on lower frequencies, on lower frequencies. of 15 to 1,000 hertz. A hertz it means cycles per second. So our house is at 60 cycles per second. So this would work on there. And it is the D-Y-N-A-M-O-M-E-T-E-R dynamometer. And what does this one do? One, it uses uses an electro uses an electromagnet instead of that permanent magnet. Remember the D. Arsenval or Watson? It had one permanent magnet and one electromagnet. This is going to use two electros. So use an electromagnet instead of a permanent magnet. Let's see. Picture. Picture, picture. There we go. So the idea of changing out the permanent magnet with the electromagnet, now you can see it's running two electromagnets. And what you get when you do that is before, this side over here was always north and this side over here was like always south. Well now, as the electromagnet here has, a, has AC and it's swapping, so does the stationary magnet. It swaps with it. So when the north swap ends on the, on the uh, moving one, swap ends on the big one, the stationary. So that's going to keep it actually reading accurately. Um. Is that spins? Okay, well, it doesn't spin. Well, it, does, it just moves a little bit. So we'll just say at one moment, this is north and this is south. And in order for this to deflect, this would have to be set. Well, I don't like the way they drew it that way because it it's got to draw it, suck it up into here. So I guess this would have to be a south, and this would have to be the north end. And then it would pull it up into it. I guess we could say that. I don't, I don't love the way they drew that. I think it'd make more sense if they would have drew, the, drew it a little bit different. But if you follow what I'm saying, because it's got to repel it. So in this case, I'm saying, well, this becomes south, so it draws this down in. Does everybody follow that? OK, so for one. We're talking about AC, so during that period, it's going to look like that, and then we'll go blue, and then when it swings back up the other way, it's going to change. Then this becomes south, this becomes north. In order for it to work, this becomes north, and this becomes south. Everything swaps. So not only does the movable magnet swap, like it just did a little bit ago, but we had a permanent magnet, which then just caused it to shake and not work. Now we're going to swap out the stationary magnet because this is the stationary magnet let me clean this up a little bit and just tell you about this uh, clear so in looking at this this right here this thing right here that's called a pole shoe a pole we're going to see a lot of that it's an iron core so all of this right here this whole thing here, is a soft iron core that easily passes electricity and you have one on the other side and what happens is and depending on how the wires are run there's the left hand rule of thumb the right hand rule of thumb and basically it's where you you can show if current is flowing this way your fingers represent um, how the wires are run which we're going to get into that in a week or two um, how if it's a north or south It'll make you memorize that. Don't worry about that. But it's just, it's a rule. So depending on how, how these wires are ran, depends on if it's north or south or how it works. So hopefully you can follow it. So you have a pole shoe, and then the, the copper wire is ran around there. And you can see that it's connected over here. So really, it's going to run one way on the right side and run the opposite way on the left side. That way you get a north on one side and a south on the other. But then 
electricity is going to change like I just showed and so the north and the south swap but it also does that in the moving magnet so it all stays balanced out yeah is the moving magnet coil too yes it's also a coil so everything in there is a coil so you have two well three coils right you got one coil here two there those are the stationary and then you have a third coil right here which that's also three there We're going to talk so much about magnets. From here on out, I don't think I ever stop talking about magnets for the rest of this year. That's good, because I was just about to ask you how like, the magnets work. I mean, I know you kind of explained it, but like... Oh, we'll get more into it. Okay. All right, use electrons to a permanent magnet. Where am I here? Um, let me see. B... The coil needle, coil needle, needle is connected, is connected, is connected in series or parallel. Doesn't matter. Somebody's figured out why it's better to do series and why it's better to do parallel. I don't know that and I'm not going to force you to. Um, two and two and electromagnet. So that means that whatever f series, whatever flows through one is going to flow through the other. In parallel, not necessarily. Indicating needle. And when we get into motors, we're going to talk about the difference in series in parallel or series in shunt wound and what that means and how the current flows through. Indicating needle needle always moves in the same direction regardless of polarity indicating needle always moves in the same direction same direction uh, regardless of polarity So really, there is no more red lead and black lead. They're just both kind of red or both kind of black. And why is that? Because polarity of both the needle and coil change together. Of both needle and coil change together all right I think this is the, the last one I'm talking about I think so maybe one more iron vein yes I could do the Iron Man song to that I am iron vein <laughs> <coughs> Iron vein, there's an iron vein. So in the iron vein, the needle is attached to an iron vein. As current flows through the solenoid, here's my solenoid. Once again, we can see that we have windings. It's called windings. Made of coil windings. You're gonna get an electromagnet is gonna happen. And this iron vein is then going to be pulled into the solenoid as, as we have more and more current flow it's going to, the magnet is going to become stronger and stronger overcoming this down here which is a spring overcoming the spring and drawing it into there so as current flows through the solenoid the iron vein is attracted and registers voltage we'll finish this point and then do a break how's that sound iron vein needle is attached to iron vein is attached to an iron vein as current flows through the solenoid
the iron vein is attracted. Attracted and regis and registers voltage. The electromagnetic electromagnetic forces are counterbalanced. are counterbalanced by the spring. There we go. One more. Should we do one more real quick? Yes. Okay. Sure. Then that's the last. And why this is D, I don't know. It just is. The rectifier type. Be careful how you say that. It's not rectum fire, it's rectifier. The rectifier type. The rectifier type uses a rectifier a rectifier to send current through the meter in one direction. In one direction. Um, it this is going to become a very important point eventually. It reads in RMS, RMS, which stands for root mean square. And I will explain that in greater detail, but not this week, because we're already a day short, um, which is 0.707 times the peak voltage. So I told you AC you know, starts at zero and it goes up like our current, we say it's 120 volts and comes down. And so you might think that, wow, if it's 120 volts that we have right here, well, this must be the 120 volt line. It's not. Um, our current actually, if this was 120 volts, then our current actually goes well above that. What we read on a voltmeter is RMS, which is 0 0.707 times what the peak actually is. So the peak voltage in the wall is actually more than what we say it is. When we say it's 110 or 120 volts, we're actually derating it and saying it's 0 .7, it's 0 0.707 times that. And we're going to get in that in electricity. But let me tell you what a rectifier looks like here because they're kind of cool. And we'll go from current Careful slide. what you Google. <laughs> <laughs> I, so when I started in aviation, there are certain things you don't want to Google. When I started in aviation, I should probably turn the camera off when I tell you this. <laughs> you know, we didn't have computers. You know, when I took my AMP test, we just did it on paper and pen. We mailed it off to the FAA and got our, you know. So I remember when we got a computer. And one of the things that you know, I, you know, I told you I worked in the engine shop and machine shop and Continentals, God love them. They have these things called Roseanne studs. And what you guys um, that have had engines, you know what a stud is in an engine. It's simply just a bolt without a head on it. And you just screw it in to something and then you got the thread sticking out. Okay. Well, Continental, especially on their exhaust ports, they use a stud, but it has a locking ring. And it actually has this ring that you pound down into the cylinder. It's, it's recessed. And so it, and it has these grooves that slide down. And then it locks it in there. And the only way to get this stud out is to take a cutter and you actually have to cut this whole locking mechanism out of the cylinder very delicately without breaking the cylinder. Yeah. And our Roseanne okay. stud cutters are, you know, they're rare, they're hard to find. And so I needed one. So, you know, being new to the internet, I just Googled studs. <laughs> 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 Not what I... <laughs> Fast forward. Decades later, <laughs> and hang on, I'll finish this. So hang on, 
you're going to know. Okay. So let's talk about this real quick before we go on break, because that was kind of a sideshow right there. What a, what a, I've, I've lost some of you now. That's just terrible. Um, it's, you can't, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, okay. What a rectifier does is, is it uses diodes. Now you guys have experienced a little bit of diodes. You know that a diode is really a check valve that only allows electricity to flow one way. Now, the, the fun part about diodes is if you kind of look at it, a diode, the symbol, it looks like this, right? But nicer. And who was it I asked to draw something out here? They didn't go, how do you do this? Yeah, it's not always easy. Okay, so um, if you kind of look at it, it's got an arrow that's pointing this way. All right, and so I kind of think about, well, if this was positive and this is negative because it was made a long time ago, then it would make sense way back in the day that if it was positive and negative, the arrow shows which way that the, the uh, current would flow. But then we have a change in convention because that was called what convention? Conventional. Conventional. Now we call it electron. electron. So what they say now is, well, wait a minute. You have the negative right here. If you put that on the negative side, it turns it on. So the negative towards the negative turns it on. So we can look at it that way. So here we have an AC source. And right now they're showing that this is the negative side and this is the positive side over here. So if we follow, and remember it's going to switch because AC goes back and forth. Over on the right you can see it's plus and minus. Let me go to the laser. So if we follow electron theory flow, we, what we want to end up with is always having current flow through this load from negative to positive. No matter what the source is doing, I want it to flow down through here. So how do I get that? Well, it's going to come up through here, and it's going to this, go to this point right here. And it tries, if the electrons try to go this way, it's going to be off, and it won't stop that. So I wish I could make it not do that, because that's, okay. So it goes this way up through here to this point, and of course it can't go this way, so it's forced to go this way, down, over, and then if it tries to come this way, this is where it can get really confusing. You can think, oh, but it's negative. No, it's not. It's positive. So positive is going to come up this way. It can't go that way, right? So it's forced to go through this way, up, over, and down. Okay. Yeah, let me, okay, let me explain. There's, no, you can't think, when you get into this type of stuff, there aren't absolutes. There's more negative and less negative, more positive and less positive. And so if we come up through here, I came back around over to here. This is a hard one to explain. I've got something on this side and something on this side. Which side is more positive? Well, if we follow it along here, this is full blown positive here, okay? Which if there's been any loss of voltage, this becomes the negative side. So the negative turns it on, it goes around and through. Just remember that, it's not absolute. And of course on this side, it's the same thing, but backwards, it comes up through here. We have the negative, or full blown negative comes this way. It won't go that way because we're negative and that, that's backwards for negative. Down through here, over, up. Okay, so now we're um, positive full-blown positive and so it can't go that way and back around that way so um maybe probably because i did it really fast so, but so just follow it through it doesn't flow the way the triangle is pointed it flows opposite that if you're doing the negative to positive the negatives turn it on okay. if i want to do positive i have to go against the arrows because they drew this in in electron uh theory flow i don't know what way it's gone well, it's real easy because I can see the positive and I can see how it's going to happen. So if I come up, well, we'll do this side. I can see the negative and I can see they drew it this way. So I know it's negative to positive. And then once I know how they're drawing it, I can just follow it. It doesn't matter how they drew it. The, it's still going to work the same way. I could have just followed it backwards and just said, well, it goes this way, it comes to here. The positive turns that on. So then it goes this way, positive to negative back around this way then it comes to here and now I am uh, it's confusing I'm still positive so positive is going to come down this way and then down over 
whatever. So break time before I hurt myself. Hang on.